Hey, YouTube friends and family. Hello. God bless you. You know, I always forget to say, like everybody else says on their videos, if you watch this and you enjoy it, subscribe or share it with somebody, that would help me out a lot. Um, not that I really need help, but um, we're all working together as the body of Christ, so... It's helpful to get messages out to share them or to um, to subscribe and share them with your friends and that type of thing just to get the gospel message out. So let's be co-laborers as the Lord told us to be. As, as you feel led of the Lord, please do subscribe and, and share if you feel led to. Today I'm going to be talking about true judgment out of Matthew chapter 7 and um, you know the the scribes and the Pharisees they were guilty of exercising false judgment about their own selves about other people and even about the Lord their um, their false righteousness helped to encourage this false judgment so this actually explains why our Lord closed this important sermon with a discussion of judgment. In it, he discussed three different judgments. And um, I'll begin with our judgment of, of ourselves in seven, chapter seven, verses one through five. The first principle of judgment is that we begin with ourselves, of course. Jesus did not forbid us to judge others for Careful discrimination is essential in the Christian life. So you know how many times we hear, oh, don't judge me. Uh, oh, don't judge that person. Well, you know what? Uh, let, we're going to have a little bit different look at this today. Because he did not forbid us to judge others. Um, Christian love is not blind. See Philippians 1, 9 and verse 10. The person who believes that he hears and he he accepts everyone who claims to be spiritual will be will actually experience confusion and and probably great spiritual loss but but before we judge others we must also or we must first actually judge ourselves and so there are several reasons for this and I'm going to go over those for number 1 in, in verse 1 we shall be judged ourselves so the the tense of the verb judge signifies a once for all final judgment. If we first judge ourselves, then we are preparing for that final judgment when we face God. The Pharisees played God, so to speak, quote and end quote, as they condemned other people, but they never considered that God would, would he's going to one day judge them. And then number two, we are being judged, as we see in verse 2, the parallel passage in Luke 6, 37 and 38 is helpful here. Not only will God judge us at the end, but people are also judging us right now. They're watching our lives and they're judging us. And we receive from people exactly what we give. So the kind of judgment and the measurement our measure of judgment comes right back to us because the Bible says, as you judge, you will be judged. So we reap what we have sown. And then verses three through five, we must so clearly see, um, see clearly how to help others because the purpose of self-judgment is to prepare us to what? To serve others. Christians are obligated to help each other grow in grace, grow in maturity. And when we don't judge ourselves, we not only hurt other hurt ourselves, but we also hurt those to whom we could have ministered to. So the Pharisees judged and they criticized others to make themselves look good. You know, um, See Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. 
but Christians should judge themselves so that they can help others look good. That's the difference. That is the difference right there. So let's look at our Lord's illustration of this point. Jesus chose the symbol of the eye because this is one of the most sensitive areas of the human body. And, and so the picture of, of a man with a, a two-by-four stuck in his eye trying to remove a speck of dust from another man's eye is a ridiculous sight, a ridiculous picture, but it, but it makes the point. So if, if we do not honestly face up to our own sins and confess them, then we blind others to ourselves. And then we can't see clearly enough to even help others, which is what we're supposed to be doing. So the Pharisees saw the sins of other people, but they would not at all look at their own sins. And then in Matthew 6, verses 22 through 23, Jesus used the illustration of the eye to teach us how to have a spiritual outlook on life. So we must not pass judgment on others' motives. That's one thing we can't pass judgment on because only God can see the heart. So we need to examine their actions and attitudes, but we cannot judge their motives for only God can see the heart. Only God knows the very intent or motive, whatever you call it, very intent behind what they're doing, what they're saying, how they're acting. He knows the motives behind everything. So it's possible for a person to do good work with bad motives, but it's also possible to fail in a task and um, yet be very sincerely motivated in that task. So when we stand before the Lord at the judgment seat, he's going to examine the, the secrets of the heart and reward us accordingly, as it says in Romans chapter 2, verse 16. And the image of the eye teaches us another truth, that we must um, exercise love and tenderness when we seek to help other people. See Ephesians 4, uh, verse 15. <clears throat> there are two extremes that must be avoided in this matter of spiritual self-examination. The first is the deception of the shallow examination. And sometimes we're so sure of ourselves that we fail to examine our hearts honestly and thoroughly. A quick glance into the mirror of the Word of God, though, will never reveal the true situation. James, see James 1, 22 through 25. We've got to be extreme. We've got to get into the word of God and really look at our hearts in honesty before the word of God. The second extreme is what I call a perpetual autopsy. You know, sometimes we get so wrapped up in self-examination that we become unbalanced. So we should, we should not look only at ourselves or we'll become discouraged and defeated. We should look by faith at Jesus Christ and let him forgive and let him restore us. So we know that the devil is the accuser of the brethren, as we see in Revelation 12, verse 10, and he enjoys it when we accuse and even when we condemn ourselves. He's the accuser. He's the one pointing his finger at us all the time. So then after we've judged ourselves honestly before God and we've removed those things that blind us, then we can help others and properly judge their works. But if we know that there are sins in our own lives and we try to help others, we are just hypocrites. In fact, it's possible for ministry to be a device to cover up sin sometimes. The Pharisees were guilty of this, and Jesus denounced them for it. So our judgment of others, Christians must exercise discernment for not everyone is a sheep. Some people are dogs or hogs. Some are wolves in sheep's clothing, and we are the Lord's sheep. 
But this doesn't mean that, that we should let people pull the wool over our eyes. This doesn't mean we should be so naive sometimes that we second guess our own, our very own discernment. In verse 6, the reason that we must judge is as God's people, we're privileged to handle the holy things of the Lord. He has entrusted uh, to us the precious truths of the word of God. See 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and then we must regard them carefully. No dedicated uh, priest, and God has called us kings and priests, would rather throw meat from the altar to a filthy dog. And only a fool would give pearls to a pig. So while it's true that we must carry the gospel to every creature, the Bible says, Mark 16, 15, it is also true that we must not cheapen the gospel by a ministry that lacks discernment. So even Jesus refused to talk to Herod in Luke 23, verse 9, and Paul refused to argue with people who resisted the word of God. Why should we waste our breath? Don't bother to argue with them. They've already got the answer or they wouldn't be arguing with you. Um, and if, they, if it's the spirit of religion in them, they're going to find argument in anything, no matter what you say, especially the word of God. They're going to find their way around to be able to do in their way, not God's way. They're going to pick and choose the scriptures most often and use what they want to um, verify what they do in their lives is okay. And sometimes, excuse me, sometimes it is not okay. So the reason for judgment then is not that we might condemn others. That is not it at all, but that we might be able to minister to them. Notice that um, Jesus always dealt with individuals according to their needs and according to their spiritual condition. He, didn't, he did not have to have a memorized speech that he used with everybody. You know, he, he discussed the new birth with Nicodemus, but he spoke of living waters uh, to the Samaritan woman. When religious leaders tried to trap him, he refused to answer their questions at all. In Matthew 21. So it's a wise Christian who first assesses the condition of a person's heart before sharing precious pearls with them. Then in verses 7 uh, through verse 11, the resources that God gives us. Whoops. Let's see. I lose my place. The resources that God gives us. Why did our Lord discuss prayer at this point in his message? The, verse, the verses actually seem to be an interruption, but they're, they're not. You and I are human, and we're fallible. We make mistakes. Only God can judge perfectly. So we must pray and seek his wisdom, seek his direction. If it, the Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God in James 1 and 5. And then there was young King Solomon. He knew uh, that he lacked and he needed wisdom to judge Israel, so he prayed to God, and the Lord graciously answered him with buckets of wisdom. So if, if we're to have spiritual discernment, we must keep on asking God to keep to keep on seeking his will, keep on knocking at the door that leads to greater ministry. God meets the needs of his children. God wants us to have wisdom. He wants us to do greater things. He wants us to go deeper with him. So then in verse 12, this is the so-called golden rule, one of the most misunderstood um, statements in the Bible. This statement is not the sum total of Christian truth, nor is it God's plan of redemption. 
So we should no more build our theology on the golden rule than we should build our astronomy on twinkle, twinkle, little star. So this great truth is a principle that, that ought to govern our attitudes toward others. It, it only applies to believers, and it must be practiced in every area of life. So the person who practices the golden rule refuses to say or do anything that would harm himself or others. So if our judging of others is not governed by this principle, we will be become proud, become critical, and um, our own spiritual character will degenerate. Practicing the golden rule releases the love of God in our lives, and it enables us to help others. So even those who want to hurt us, God wants us to help them. We have to remember that practicing the golden rule means paying a price. So if we want God's best for our, ourselves and others, but others resist God's will, then we will, or excuse me, they will oppose us. We are salt. Amen? And salt stings the open wounds. So, so we're light, and the light exposes darkness, or the light exposes dirt. And then in verses 13 through 20, since there are false prophets in the world, we must be careful of deception. But the greatest danger is self-deception. The scribes and Pharisees had fooled themselves into believing that they were righteous and others were sinful. So it's possible for people to know, say, know the right language, and as some people say, know Christianese, believe intellectually, and believe the right doctrines intellectually, obey the right rules, but still not be saved. So Jesus used two pictures to help us judge ourselves and others. And the two ways in verses 13 and 14, they are, of course, the way to heaven and the way to hell. The broad way is the easy way. It's the popular way, but we must not judge spiritual profession by statistics. So the majority is not always right. Those that are following the big, long crowd out there are not always the ones going in the right direction. The fact that everybody does it is no proof that they are doing, that what they are doing is right. It's quite the contrary, actually. So God's people have always been a remnant, a small minority in this world, and the reason is not difficult to discover. Because the way of life is narrow, it's lonely, and it's costly. We can walk on the broad way. We can walk on that wide road and keep our baggage of sin and keep our worldliness. But if, if, the, if we enter the narrow way, then we must give up those things. Actually, you can't walk on the broad, the broad road that leads to destruction and the narrow road too. There are only two roads. You're going to have to choose one or the other. There is no middle road. There is no middle ground. But, but if we enter the narrow way, there are things that we're going to have to give up. It is going to cost you to walk the walk. So here then would be the first test. Did, you, did your profession of faith in Christ cost you anything? If not, then it was not a true profession of faith. Many people who trust Jesus Christ never leave the broad road with its appetites and associations. They have an easy Christianity that, that makes no demands on them. Yet Jesus said that the narrow way was hard. So we can't walk on the two roads in different directions at the same time. You will be torn apart. Can you imagine one foot on the wide road, one foot on the narrow road, and trying to walk forward? You're going to split yourself in two. So then the two trees in verses 15 through 20, these show that the true faith in Christ 
changes the life and produces fruit for God's glory. Everything in nature reproduces after its own kind. And this is so true in the natural realm. God's good fruit comes from a good tree. Bad fruit comes from a bad tree. The tree that produces rotten fruit, and this is what the Bible says, it's not what I'm saying. The tree that produces rotten fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In Matthew 7, verse 20, it says, Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So then the second test is this. Did my decision for Christ change my life? False prophets who teach false doctrine can produce only a false righteousness. See Acts 20, verse 29. So their fruit or the result of their ministry is false and it cannot last. The prophets themselves are false. The closer we get to them, the more we see the falsity of their lives and doctrines. They magnify themselves, not Jesus Christ. And I am going to close here in regard to judging. They magnify themselves, not Jesus Christ, and their purpose is to exploit people, not to edify them. So the person who believes false doctrine or who uh, follows a false prophet will never experience a changed life. And unfortunately, some people do not realize this until it's too late. So in saying that, I'm going to say I hope you listened carefully to to what this whole message was because it could be a matter of life and death for some people. We need to make right choices. We need to lay our life out before God in truth, in honesty of heart, in transparency, because I guarantee you might fool people, but you will never fool the Lord. He sees the very intents and purposes of your heart. Like so many are in ministry for different reasons. Uh, some just like the popularity. Some like to be up in front of people. Some just like uh, their the money. Uh, they run their churches like a business. They make pretty good money. Then, um, and they don't have to work much either. So, you know, so be it, whatever. The bottom line is, let's get it straight for ourselves because we are accountable. Each and every one of us are accountable for what we know, for what we've been taught, for what we've heard in our ear. We're responsible for that. So what choices have you made today? Were they the right choices? Were they um, true choices? And can we judge others? Yes, we can. We sure can. And we need our discernment higher at a higher level today than ever in the history of time, I believe. In saying that, I'm going to say thank you for stopping by. Thank you for studying the word with me. You guys are a blessing, and um, I know God is raising up so many right now to serve him with everything within them. They are counting the cost. They are willing to pay the price to get the gospel out there, and there is a cost to it for sure. But you know what? God's grace is sufficient for me, and it's sufficient for you too.